Hey everybody, welcome to ASG Astronomy. In this video tutorial we're going to walk through how to adjust tilt and back focus um, using a variety of tools. Uh, we're going to focus mainly on NINA and the new Hocus Focus system. I guess it's not really new, it's been out for over a year. Um, but some of these tools have changed and I want to kind of do a revised um, video on how to adjust tilt. Um, I've you know, switched up my own methods and how I, I do it. I keep tweaking um, what I do because I like to just take images. And so I'm going to walk through kind of the quickest method I can to, uh, to showing you how to adjust tilt. And we're going to take a look at ASTAP as well um, and some other tools. You may use this video um, for any other device. It would work equally as well. I'm going to focus it around our product, which is a uh, photon cage. Um, it is a four-corner tilt adjuster and back focus system that has a uh, four-corner tilting. Uh, but it could work. This video might be helpful if you're using um, other tools as well. Um, now, if you're new to the series, I have this is the third part. Um, the first part was kind of an introduction to our photon cages and what we offer. Um, so I don't want to cover that here. Uh, part two is how to actually set up and install uh, your camera. Let's say you purchased one of these and how do you actually get it zeroed out? Um, how do you get some basic measurements? Um, set up to begin with with your device and then get it onto the scope so that's part two video um, I'm not going to cover that here either I want this video mainly to just focus on how do you adjust tilt when you got an evening you're ready to go out you've got Nina set up um, or you're gonna start taking images um, what's my process to do it um, right or wrong it's been working really well for me and so I thought I'd go ahead and share that um, so let's go ahead and jump in here. Um, first off, let's take a look at uh, at Nina itself. Um, hopefully, you have this running. Maybe you're familiar with it. You're, you're taking some basic images with it. Uh, in order to get Hocus Focus installed, um, there is under plugins. Uh, you can just go to available plugins, and these are all the different extra additional plugins that developers have created for Nina. And you can install Hocus Focus. Um, George here is the creator of this. It's a really good tool. Um, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's now uh, probably one of the leading contenders for one of these um, uh, aberration inspectors that let you adjust tilt as well. Um, so once you install it, you'll notice uh, it shows up in your plugins area here, and you do have a variety of options. Uh, I typically just leave these options um, by default. Now, uh, there is one good setting here, which is save, and this is nice because you can actually save all of your autofocus curve runs, and you can play them back later in the day and kind of study them and see what they're doing and and, and reload them into Nina. Um, and I've done that here. I, I went out and took uh, several runs last night. So I wanted to kind of walk through exactly what I would do um, from bad tilt to good tilt. Um, and you can see if those methods um, work for you, if it's helpful. Um, so this save feature is kind of nice. Just know if you do engage the save feature, the files are really huge. A um, couple gigs worth, so it could eat up a hard drive, especially if you let, a, um, let it run all night and you do several autofocuses. You might want to make sure you turn that off. It's just kind of hidden in the plug-in. Um, there's a few other options we want to take a look at and kind of I consider these prerequisites in order to make this whole thing work. Um, again, you spend a lot of money on your images, or I mean on your equipment. You spend a lot of money on software. You, you know, you want the round stars in your system. And I've always kind of looked at, um, I always kind of looked at astrophotography as uh, a really simple equation here of you know hardware and software it's a combination of the two in order to make really good astro quality images um, I think if you you know if you go heavy on the software side I know there's some really new software coming out um, that's nice for example Blur Exterminator has been doing a great job um, and I'm I'm 100% uh, uh, believer in what it's doing. It, it's uh, taking the PSFs of your images and really fine-tuning them 
um, you know you can you can increase software uh, to a point and that really can help your astro quality I think uh, I think hardware also comes into play here I think if you the old adage of garbage in and garbage out um, you, you've got hardware you can really you know spend a lot of money on good hardware uh, which is great but unless you can really process that and make a make a final image you know you still do need the software side of it so Astro quality really isn't all about just buying really good hardware either. I think there's really a good blended balance here. I think most people know this that uh, the better the hardware and the better the software, the tools really mesh together. And I think you see that um, kind of coming together um, recently with uh, not only Astro equipment really taking off and ways to fine-tune your images with the hardware but I think you also see some of the software improvements as well um, you know the tilting has always been a hardware issue how do you physically get your camera to to be um, with that with that sensor uh, in the right spot and, and with the tilt device that's how you do that it's very hardware oriented but um, you know you see software on the other side really taking advantage of some of its tools to try and correct it even further and what I've been running into is not only are flat good tilt free images great but then running them through something like blur exterminator only enhances them even further so I really think it's a good combination of what we're seeing happen now <clears throat> again once you install um, this plugin uh, you'll see over here on your images you will see an aberration inspector show up here as a tab now if you don't see that tab you can come up here to your top toolbar and you can turn that on and off um, that uh, that way you can get the panel to show up and uh, before we dive into running a run uh, a couple more prerequisites in your options I think are important first one is under your autofocus uh, you really should be able to get a good uh, v-shaped autofocus curve if you can't do that there's no point in really running hocus focus at this point so to get a good curve you really need to set for example your offset steps this is how many steps on each side of focus do you want um, I set it at four um, you can try three but it's getting a little low sometimes you do five um, over here you can set up how many exposures per point um, I usually leave it at one just for speed but you could bump that to two and it kinda does a repeat focus on the same point just to kinda make sure and verify the numbers are correct um, that's a good feature to do maybe once you get into production and you really want to have perfect focus um, this one up here which is autofocus step size this one's the one I see most off often um, incorrect for people they really struggle getting a good autofocus curve and they don't set this um, up maybe appropriately now this depends on the hardware you have if you run for example a Celestron eFocuser those have about a thousand rotate a thousand steps per rotation um, you know that's the resolution of that motor uh, if you use a red ZWO um, eFocuser they have a resolution that does 5670 steps per turn and so you're getting five and a half times the resolution on one of those to make adjustments now they'll both do a great job but you have to realize what it what it's doing is it takes more on a ZWO focuser to actually make a move um, of equal value over on your imaging and on your focusing curve so you know I run 300 to 350 on a red ZWO focuser before I can really get a good v-shaped curve but I might bump that down to even you know 50 or 80 um, if I was using a Celestron focuser uh, because they only have a thousand steps per turn and so it can really vary uh, based on what equipment you're using so be sure to check um, and if you can't get a good e-focus or e-focus curve you might come in here and make sure you're running a high enough step count until you do okay um, the other thing I like to set in here in my autofocus settings is the method at which we um, fit our curve and I use parabolic curves 
Um, I know some people use trend lines or they use uh, trends and hyperbolics. Uh, I find parabolic works really good. I think um, Hocus Focus likes the parabolic system as well um, for fitting, uh, but I'm not entirely sure on what it's using. But if you have trouble making a fit over in Hocus Focus, you might check this section and make sure you're on parabolic. Okay. So those are that's my first um, kind of prerequisite I always check. Make sure you've got your autofocuser set up. Make sure you can run a good V-shaped curve. Run a few of them. And then we can uh, do the next step. Uh, the next thing I really uh, focus on is, uh, I see people doing correctly, is the star field. Um, if I look at, let's say, North American Nebula, we're going to be looking at a part of the Milky Way. You want to make sure you're not taking an image of any nebula, uh, any star clusters. You want a really flat field of stars. And this is a good example of what not to take. Uh, you've got too much activity going on here. Uh, it's better to move off to a section where you have just stars in a field. Okay, And the Milky Way is the best. Uh, try to avoid looking out into galaxy season because there's just usually not enough stars in the field to get really good uh, measurements. Um, we want we want a field with thousands of stars in there. So uh, I might look at a region like this away from that. I try to avoid these wispy uh, nebula regions like this. Um, I try to not put a bright star in one corner. Um, so you kind of have to hunt around in the Milky Way where you're at and what might fit best for you. Okay, so that's kind of my second prerequisite. Good star fields good autofocus curves and then we can go ahead and start running some uh, saved images now let me load up a couple um, let me let me try this first one and see what it looks like uh, again I took a couple runs last night from start to finish it took me about four adjustments and it got dialed in and this is a good example here this one um, you can see my curves uh, when you run this are going to show you each corner and as well as your center focus and we can see the curves don't line up what we want them to do is all lay on this center line and so we know that basically the image is in focus at the same point whether it's left top left bottom right we want these focusers to be at the same spot and you can see it gives me the focus of each corner in different areas and I can even click on these and it will show me that's top right that's bottom right that's top left and that's bottom left so what we really have here is basically a left to right image it's completely tilted and you can see that here in some of this data now before we jump into really going through the data we want to make sure we have this all set up and understand what tilt is um, again this is a good star field for example there's no nebula there's no uh, there's no star cluster right in the middle um, just flat stars going on and if we zoom in so if you're kinda of wondering do you have tilt take a look at the corners of your images and if you see these little kinda pieces of rice they're not round circles they're, they're elongated stars they're shooting off in kind of a circular pattern around my image okay over here they look like they're shooting in or cometing um, you know you'll hear these called all different kinds of things from eggs to something else um, this is going to be pretty indicative of tilt and back focus issues uh, especially if you're getting a good focusing curve on the thing uh, so what we want to do is get rid of that and like I said you, you spend thousands of dollars on this equipment you know this is the kind of stuff you want to get rid of obviously stars shouldn't be like little pieces of rice in here so um, that's what we're going to focus on with this tool now we come over here to this aberration inspector and it gives us a lot of data when we run one of these and so let's take a look at one other section before we dive into that and that is the options so I'm gonna open up this little tab right here called options 
and in fact I can just clear this so you don't even see that information um, this is going to set up I can basically override my autofocus settings that we just discussed in the options panel I can set up maybe five focuser steps or I could set up you know 335 you know for my step size um, I know my focus curves are good so I'm just going to leave all of these at default okay the one thing people ask is what is the focuser step size and how do you calculate this and this is going to be calculated per telescope and so you need to know two things you need to know what your focuser has per turn in terms of steps and you need to know on your scope on the actual focuser how many millimeters does it move per turn uh, and so you can contact your scope manufacturer for example I contacted Celestron and for a Raza 11 uh, one full turn of the focuser knob is one millimeter that's the thread pitch um, for the focuser uh, I think uh, and don't quote me on this but I think this like Celestron Edge HD the SCTs are 0.75 millimeter threads um, whereas the Raza's are one millimeter um, if you have a refractor um, you can actually put calipers on it and you can actually test and just move your focuser knob one full turn and see how far your system moves if you can grab that measurement um, if you can't that's fine you can always just put in one here and and that's fine to do as well but if you do want the accurate measurements here in microns you need to figure this out and so if I take my Raza let's open a calculator here real quick I'll show you how to calculate it my Raza is one millimeter per turn and I use a ZWO focuser I just divide that by 5670 that's how many steps are in one turn of my focuser and I get a value of 0.17 microns okay now if I use let's say uh, an SCT which is 0.75 uh, millimeters per revolution on my focuser uh, then I let's say I'm using a Celestron focuser it's it's 1000 so I'll divide this by 1000 okay and I basically get 0.75 uh, microns uh, per turn and so my focuser step size is going to show me how many microns that adjustment is now just to put this into perspective um, a piece of paper is about a hundred microns thick uh, a human blood cell is about 35 microns and we're going to be adjusting down to like 5 10 microns so these adjustments are very sensitive and I get asked all the time you know what if I rotate my camera will I have to retilt yeah um, if you pull your camera off and put it back on you're gonna have to redo tilt or at least check it and probably tweak it just a little bit so it's right um, you know if you're if you're at this level you're, you're gonna be looking at sensitivity levels that are very um, picky um, you could just screw in a, uh, a tilt adjuster and you're just denting aluminum and that's enough to throw it off so you want to be very uh, precise with what we have here and, and realize how precise it actually is um, I know my focuser step size is 0.17 this is for a Raza 11 with a red ZWO focuser okay and that's a good just so people understand what that's doing um, and that is here in our extra options so I'm gonna go ahead and load that focuser up again uh, I've saved these using that save feature and when you run it it does a focus curve let's jump back on here and you can see each corner where it's at in that focus okay and I can see that this is actually two of my curves two of my corners are actually in line with each other and this side two are in line with each other as well and we determined that by looking down here and it shows us this um, visualization of it and sure enough it shows us that it's just kind of rocked left to right now this gives us really good information here that shows us the focuser position that's actually on my electronic focuser this shows me how many adjustment steps it would take to get to the right focus this breaks it down from the hardware level to what am I actually having on my scope 
um, in terms of microns. So this section will only correlate really well, really well if you have your focus or step size in there. Now you don't have to. Uh, for example, if I leave this as one, um, notice this has given me like about 80 microns. Okay, I'm going to run this again, but just put one in there just to give you an example of what it will do. It's running the same data. It's running the same focus. It's just going to give you different numbers. And so if you don't know your focus or step size, just put one in there. It's perfectly fine to do. Um, what it's going to do is just kind of give you relative values. You see how it's just a one-to-one -one relationship with your step size. Um, that's fine as well. It really tells us which ones are off the most. So there's nothing wrong with doing that, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, but, you know, I know a lot of people really want to know. Um, you know down at the micron level what it is so I go ahead and put that in there run the same data and it really breaks it down for me it just does that ratio now keep in mind too that we are talking about um, the adjustable microns down at the sensor level now if we jump over here and take a look at for example our device we adjust tilt out here and I think this is one thing I confuse people with on the other video is I said you know adjust here which you do but you're actually looking at data which is down here on the sensor okay and so the sensitivity of it is actually desensitized by adjusting out here at a further radius area than what you are seeing in here so uh, when we jump back to look at the values, you might say, well, I just need to adjust that corner 80 microns. That is at the sensor level down in there. And so out here, you have to adjust it a little bit more um, in order to get that sensor to actually adjust that amount. And so there's a little bit of sensitivity um, there. In the, big, in, in the big scheme of things, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, in the big scheme of things it's going to be a relational thing you're going to make an adjustment and you're going to see if it's going in the right direction that's the key um, not so much as can I get this dialed in in one turn that that's never going to happen you're just going to keep adjusting three or four times until you really break it down and get it going in the right direction okay uh, as we scroll down through here this is kind of nice it gives us uh, history again I ran that four times so it gives us that history of how many adjustment steps this is great because you used to have to write it down I really like having the history here and I can see where things are moving if we just scroll down real quick we've got a contour map and we have an eccentricity guide um, this kind of shows which way the all the stars are cometing or egging in and you can see it was on the left and the right are the worst and down the middle here it actually looks pretty good um, that kind of correlates and, and that jives with what we're doing up above okay we can see it is left to right tilt right in the middle it does look pretty good um, now let's take a look at the sensor model this data right here is the raw data coming in from your focusers you'll notice that they are close but they don't really match up I can't I can't take one corner for example and just bend it into submission uh, we're talking about a flat piece of aluminum here it's a sensor it's flat it's steel we're we're working with a hard object so I can't just bend a corner um, and that's important because we're going to talk about planes here I can only I can only move one plane at a time I can only move let's say this right side and I gotta leave these down or I can only adjust diagonally on one plane I can't just take one corner and dip it okay and so this is where I think the sensor model has been doing a better job for me uh, I like to switch this on and you'll notice it it tries to model the sensor here um, a little bit differently I think it's trying to model it more as a hard flat object which it is it's a it's not a round curved object it's actually a sensor and so <clears throat> you can turn the 3D model on and off and you can see this is actually going to give us a little bit more um, I think useful data I've been, I've been enjoying this section a little bit more than I did at the beginning 
Um, you can see it's kind of right down the middle. It's a left to right issue here. And that kind of jives too with what happened on the front. Um, as we look down here at some other data, let's just kind of go through this to give you an idea. It shows how many stars. It shows you if you got a good fit or not. If you don't have a lot of stars, you might see this model fit go way down. Uh, if you take nebula, it might be a bad fit. Um, over here we've got you know how much tilt is off our curvature radius I like this feature I think the curvature radius is a good back focus indicator um, now a good analogy here is to take a baseball a round sphere and just hold your camera sensor up to it and you'll see how much curvature is on there when you have just a baseball and a baseball or a softball let's say or a volleyball let's say is one foot wide you know that's not very big you would see a lot of curvature even if you put a sensor up to it now if we jump out here our curvature radius is almost eight meters um, so the diameter there is a 16 meter beach ball I mean that's a big beach ball and if you put a little sensor like our camera up on it um, the curvature is not really going to be there. It's going to be pretty flat. So what you're going to look for is a large curvature radius. That's going to be the bigger the ball, the better. And you know, I like to shoot for uh, five meter or five thousand millimeters up to uh, you know ten thousand. You know, eight thousand like this is good. It's it's a big, huge surface. It may not be enough for the analysis down here. Um, you'll see this analysis section kind of gives you some recommendations. This can really vary. Um, you know, I'm working at F2, and the critical focus zone is only six microns. That is this gray area, and critical focus depends on the f ratio of your scope. Um, if you're running, let's say, an epsilon or something, it might be 12. It might be slower. Um, you know, if you jump up to F4, F5, you, you're going to have a bigger critical focus zone. The faster the scope, you jump down to a hyperstar, this is going to be really hard to get completely gray. Um, and you may never reach these check marks. And so I just, I don't really focus on those. Um, I just want to show them to you so you kind of understand what it's doing. Uh, in my scope, in my situation at F2, uh, my zone is 6 microns. And so in order to get this to check off, I have to be within 25% of that, which means I need to be within 1.2 microns uh, to be in the critical focus zone. I may get that, I may not. I'm not going to focus on it. We're just interested in getting really good stars. But that's what the data is going to show you right there. Now. This is the area I like to focus on. This is really kind of the core area for me at this point where I'm looking. I have the sensor model on after I run one and I come down here to the actual tilt adjustments and you'll notice excuse me you'll notice that the adjustments are going to kind of mirror themselves now this one just happens to mirror them exactly on either one, but you'll notice uh, top right and bottom left, they're going to be exact opposites. And that's because if I want to adjust those, I have to equally adjust them. If I screw one in 120, i got to screw the other one out 120. That's just how leveling a hard steel plate is going to work. And so I feel like this model gives me a little bit better data um, in terms of that. Now, I would look at this and say, okay, obviously my left and my left are identical. And my right and my right are identical. Okay, so what we don't know at this point is where's my top, where's my bottom, where's my top left, bottom right. I get asked that all the time. Um, and it can vary. I can say that right now. It just depends on your scope. Every time your, your image goes through a mirror, it's going to image left and right. It's going to flip. You go through lenses and they can flip vertically. Um, so depending on your whole entire optical train, it's really hard to just say, oh, this is the top, this is the bottom. Now, what we can know right off the bat is with ZWO cameras, your black desiccant port right here is going to go right into this slit. We have a little recessed port for that. Okay, It goes right in that slit and it slides right in there. 
and we know that that is usually on the ZWO cameras anyway the top long edge of your uh, sensor and that correlates with a physical item on your camera and so we know that's either the top or the bottom of your image and so that gives us a good starting point what we don't know is if it's the top then that makes this the top left top right if it's the bottom that makes this the bottom left and this the bottom right um, and so we have to determine that okay and it really depends on which way the images are flipping going through your optics so for me to give a good answer it just depends so let's let's start there we know the long edge is either top or bottom okay um, so and that would correlate with these two long edges here either top or bottom uh, we just don't know corner wise so what we're gonna do is uh, I like for people to defocus um, take a real bright star put your hand over the image um, and see like you're, you're gonna be doing collimation and for example here I have the Raza cable guide and we could say with certainty that that's in this corner uh, which is fine you might say well that's bottom left that's easy to do well if you go the other way through focus um, let's say I'm under focus let's go over focus it's going to show up on this side and so that means it's going to be in this corner okay so you can't really always tell just by throwing your hand over um, it gives you a good idea it gives you the plane we could actually call this plane um, a and then let's say this one is plane B and then you might have other planes like your left plane your bottom plane your right plane your top plane you really only have six planes you can adjust okay we can either tilt it on this plane or we can tilt it on this plane but we gotta rock it back and forth it's a hard flat piece of steel okay it's just like a table or anything else that's flat um, we gotta make it level with all four corners okay so this is a good identifier this this way you can identify which plane you're working with now when I do that um, on my uh, Raza um, that correlates uh, with my you know that would be my top left or top right and bottom left um, that does correlate with what I have and so I'm gonna focus on that one I'm gonna take one of these and I'm gonna adjust it and then I'm gonna see which way is going the correct way so I jump over here and I'm gonna take this plane right here so it'll be this side and it'll be this side they're opposing sides and I will go ahead and loosen one of these lockers and I will screw this in positive uh, maybe a quarter turn and then I'll do the opposite on the other side I'll loosen the locker and I'll screw it out a quarter of a turn and I'm basically going to rock it uh, back and forth like a teeter-totter um, in order to get it to tilt and once I do that then I'm going to go ahead and lock it down now the lock screws don't do anything um, all they do is just pull it back down tight these tilters are the ones that are precision tilters and they're the ones you actually just really keep focus on you know if you screw this in a quarter turn then you screw this one out a quarter turn and then you just lock it back down okay and so I will do two at a time here um, with better luck and I'll leave the other two over here so that it kind of holds and captures the camera doesn't let the whole device flop around um, and it seems to be working a little bit better that way and so I'll go ahead and make an adjustment let's say that is uh, I know on my scoops I know on my scope here that uh, this is actually the top edge of mine and this is the bottom edge of mine and so I know that this is the top left and this one over here is the top right okay I stuck my hand in the corner I could see that I know I'm working with this plane I just not sure which one is which at this point so I'm gonna follow suit with what Nina says it says for positive values right here 
move away from objective. So if it says top left, move it 121 microns, then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to screw in the tilter uh, maybe a quarter of a turn. Okay, And what that's doing is that's pushing away from the telescope. So I'm adding 120. If I want to pull it in, I'm going to I'm going to screw the the tilter out, and then I can suck it in with the lock ring. Okay, so in this case, it says left and right. So I'm actually going to do these two over here, and I'm going to make an adjustment and see if it works. So I'm going to try to adjust the left side here, and then I'll rerun a focus curve. So let's load number two up. I know it's kind of confusing and that's why I'm hoping it'll make a little more sense as I go through and do a few more. So <clears throat> it's starting to load a focus curve here and what I like to do is I like to turn the sensor model off and that shows me my curves. And you can see by doing that these curves got closer together. That's what I needed. I needed to know if I was going in the right direction or not. And if I turn the sensor model back on you can see, obviously, my image isn't centered. But if I come down here and look at the uh, values, they went from 700 down considerably. Okay, I'm down to almost 200. What I'm saying here is I went the right way, and that's what we're looking for. Um, if and if I look at my history, I can see that. I can see that top left went from 700 down to 230 and this one went from negative 715 to negative 230 so I'm getting closer to zero on these and that means I'm going the right way that means I'm on the right side I mean I'm on the right plane I'm on the right area I now know this is my top left and this is my top right okay I know this isn't my top left over here because it would have been opposite I pushed this one out a positive value and it actually went the right, right way and that means I've gone now correctly so now I should have identified top left top right bottom left and bottom right that's gonna be the first thing you have to do is really identify what is it you're working on okay you identify the plane but then you gotta do the adjustment to actually see which way is correct and which way isn't that's the only way I've really found now that you can do it Okay, so now we know we're going the right way. I take a look at my adjustments, and what I like to do is I like to tackle the worst corners or the worst plane first. And in this case, it's top left, bottom right. They are 39 microns off, and the top right is only 32 microns off. So I'm going to tackle just the top left and bottom right. Okay, so I do that, and I rerun another curve. So let's jump on curve number three here and while that runs again I like to turn off the sensor model and I like to see my curves come in and I like to see if it calculates and gets them a little bit better and they sh you should start to see an improvement they should start to align up with each other okay and again this page is going to show you the raw data um, but it's not going to be something you can just start tweaking off of as easily as maybe the sensor model. I like the sensor model now. <clears throat> you can see our image is now pulled down a little bit more towards the center, but we're off a little bit on this left side. And again, I like to just come down here and I like to look at my sensor model tilt areas. And you can see I now went from uh, 230 steps, which is right here, my steps, down to about 48 so I'm still going in the right direction um, same with the other side bottom right I went from minus 230 to minus 48 so I'm, I'm getting there um, you notice the uh, top right bottom left have now flipped um, it's gone a little bit in the opposite direction um, but they're getting close these adjustment steps also just correlate here to my microns based on my, my situation and my scope. So I, I look at these microns and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm getting down into the micron level for the sensor 
it shows me now real clearly that my top left and my bottom right is the problem area and my top left needs to go plus 8.3 and my other one my bottom right needs to come up if you look at it visually here this corner needs to come up and this corner needs to go down I'm not gonna touch these other two I'm only gonna work on one plane at a time and I pick the worst one and that's what I work on and so I'm gonna do top left bottom right and again on my device top left and bottom right this slit is correlating with the bottom of this image on this optical system okay and I now know this is bottom right and this is top left and I need to go 8 microns and I need to go minus 8 microns so all I would do is just undo the two lockers very small amount because we're talking 8 microns I, I wouldn't even take tension off them hardly just give them a squeak and if this is a plus then I would go ahead and just screw it in just uh, and a one sixteenth if even that and this one I would give it a little squeak out and then I would lock down the lockers um, at a nice even torque um, I should say that you, you don't want to tighten anything really down you just want to bring them down snug and you kinda have to become a human torque wrench here um, to do it nice and smooth okay I would rerun this again again I'm trying to eliminate top left bottom right so let's see how we do here and so I'm gonna run number four again I like to turn the sensor model off while it runs you can see I got one that's really bad here okay and my curves are really lining up a lot better you can see how close it's getting this is my center focus this is all of my corners they're clumped together so to me it's getting really accurate it's it's getting much better okay this is the raw data let's jump over to the sensor model and you can see we eliminated that left hand side it pulled it over just a fraction it really kind of centered up our image if we come down here and take a look it says I'm off you know less than one micron um, I'm never going to get any better than that on this scope that is um, lucky I would say at the least um, you can see the little check mark for my tilt actually is off and this is at f2.2 so that is uh, that, that's pretty flat I, I would be okay with that and uh, you'll probably see that in the stars if we look at our history we went from 48 down to 5 um, and minus 48 down to 5 and so the tilt effect is very small here um, if we look at some of the other data you know curvature you know maybe we could tweak it a little bit curvature wise you might show a 3d model and be like man that should be flat maybe but we're, we're also dealing with f2 um, it could be some big netting in the corners could be some other things we're looking at there but um, you should see something fairly centered like this if it's a good flat star field um, if we scroll down take a look at some of our eccentricities you know they're kinda shooting kinda all over the place and that's fine I don't take a lot of stock in those down there um, I just really look for are my measurements getting better every time I do an adjustment and when I get to this point it really comes down to jumping over to your image and looking at it you know zoom in here are they circles are they stars can I go to the corner and zoom in and do I see a bunch of cometing these look pretty good they don't look like little pieces of rice they look like little round circle dots okay if I scroll down to the bottom same thing okay they look like little circle dots and that's what we want we want round stars like I said you, you spend so much uh, money um, this is what you're looking for and this kinda ties back to the software if you get good data like this um, you're not relying on something like software to correct these round shapes you've got them and so it can do a better job to even further bring this image 
into sharpness running something like deconvolution. So this is only going to really um, up your astrophotography by getting it flat. Okay, so I think that kind of gives you a full run. That was four, um, four adjustments I did last night. We went from 700 adjustment steps to 230 to 50 down to 5. Um, your mileage will vary. You, you'll take some practice, I will say that, to get to the point where you can do 5 and just it works. Uh, but once you kind of understand it and get the hang of it, it will be a smooth process. Now, let's go ahead and start another one. Um, I did this other one. Uh, I just kind of messed the whole thing up. and just to see if I could create another one. This one is a little bit different. Um, you can see it comes in. None of my curves are lining up. It looks kind of messy, and it is. Um, if I jump over here to my actual stars, um, well, this one wasn't actually a neb or a star field to begin with. Um, but I think my stars, I can't remember if this one was one of them. Yeah. I ended up moving off of this one, but some of the stars, it's hard to see there probably in YouTube land, but uh, some of these stars were not good at all. It was jumping all over the place. And so let's do the same thing. I turned my sensor model on, and some of this can be the nebula. Like, it's definitely going to throw it off because I got the rosette nebula in there. Okay, but let's do the same exact process here. Um, I take a look at my microns, and I can see, obviously, my top left, bottom right are the issue. And so that would be my focus of this scenario. So I'm going to go ahead and adjust those, plus 17, minus 17. And again, the way that looks on here, we've already done identification. That's this corner. Okay, plus 17, I would screw my tilter in, um, maybe an eighth of a turn. And this tilter on the bottom right, I would screw out maybe an eighth of a turn and then tighten up my two lockers. And again, we're tilting it on the, the op opposing plane is what we're doing. So that's what it would look like at the hardware side. And let's go ahead and run this again. I think I moved to a different star field here because I didn't like taking it on that. i turn my sensor model off just to see where my curves are and you can see now my curves lined up really close to each other but they're a little to the right um, on my on my image um, or on my curve here so I'm going to turn the sensor model on um, we can see that here it's just a little bit off to the side and I want to see that what I did eliminated the problem and it did you can see top left and bottom right went from, uh, well, basically 100 steps down to 5. Okay, now this is the step size right here. It's not doing the microns down here in the history. But you can see I basically went from 100 down to 5 on each of those. I didn't touch these two, and you can see that's pretty accurate. It didn't really change much on the top right, bottom left. Um, it's kind of nice too, you can click on these and you can see what you went from there to there. Okay, so I actually may have overcorrected it just slightly. If you look at this one, this is the uh, top left and we were off 100 steps, 17 microns for me, and when we adjusted it, it dropped down under and now it's just a hair too far away. Just just a hair. And you can see the same thing happen on the other side. Um, but these others didn't change much, and that's because I didn't focus on them. So that's what I like to do. I like to focus on one plane at a time, whether it's left and left, right and right, or top left, bottom right, or top right, bottom left, or just top top and bottom bottom. You know, you got six combinations there. Um, now, this, this would be my third adjustment. I would look at this and say, okay, my next problem area now is top right, bottom left. And when we look at my device, that is this one and this one. 
I know the slit is the bottom of my image and I know this is the top right this is the bottom left so I'm talking 7 microns so I might give this just a little squeak in and a little squeak out um, and then tighten up my lockers or leave my lockers you know halfway semi tight um, again you'll experiment with your hardware to see how much and now I'm going to focus on these two and just adjust them let's go ahead and load another one I think I did just three on this one again I like to turn off the uh, sensor model just so I can see all the curves come in and you can see okay yeah this one really lined up this adjustment was minor but it just pulled it right back into my center focus and if I scroll in notice how well everything is in focus right here okay that's a pretty tight group um, and so let's take a look at our sensor model and sure enough we centered this up just a hair more it got a little more gray which means we're in the critical focus zone which is great and if we come down here and look we're off just a couple of microns we definitely improved um, in that so I'm pretty happy with that okay the last thing we look at is the actual image itself um, here is my image the seeing wasn't great but I will turn on the aberration inspector by using this little um, nine quadrant grid here and you can look at these stars and see how flat those are um, those are round and this is at f2 and that's a full frame um, 6200 camera so I'm pretty pleased with that I think I can zoom around anywhere on this image oops and I don't see commenting of any kind In fact I wouldn't even really tell where I was on the image I couldn't tell if I was in the center or the left or the right that is about as good as it will get um, and so that's how you do it that's how you adjust tilt with hocus focus um, I'm hoping that clears up a few things with how to use aberration inspector um, good star field that's one critical thing good focus curves that's another thing and then I battle with the sensor model is what I do I turn the sensor model on and I do like to use these adjusted microns and I just tackle one plane at a time and I like to use the history here to see if I'm going in the right direction or the wrong direction and from there you can pretty much dial it in nice and systematically um, just to give you an idea let's jump over here real quick um, let me show you in a stop um, this is how we used to do this uh, you could drag just an image into a stop and hit f4 and this would show you just using a single image it would try to calculate out your tilt and it shows you have moderate tilt um, the off-axis aberration this is the HFD difference between the middle and the outside so you can see I'm 0.21 on average different so obviously the higher off-axis aberration the more curvature you have the worse they would get the higher the, uh, the off-axis aberration count would be here now this shows moderate tilt of 15 percent if we were to use just a stab but the problem always was which way is it in is it out um, and you have to sit there and do a few adjustments to figure it out um, and it was a little more time consuming doing that um, the other thing you could do is you know obviously graph these out um, by changing focusing points and putting them in a spreadsheet that's another way uh, this is another image um, I've got good star field um, it's down to three percent or basically no tilt you can see it starts to look like a nice square uh, your HFD values start to kind of look similar on every corner and in the center uh, our off-axis aberration is pretty low I like the off-axis aberration to be around 10 to you know point point one to point two out in that region um, 
I don't like it to be too far off. And if it is, that means you may need to adjust your back focus in and out uh, because you've got a lot of curvature. Um, but curvature can happen for a lot of reasons too. It can happen from a lot of vignetting. It can happen for from ref refractive, uh, ref reflective aberrations happening out there, um, kind of giving you some false positives. So um, again, the best method really when you get down here is, I think, Nina and Hocus Focus. I think your final inspection is always going to be your image. And, you know, so you get as close as you can and start taking some images. Um, I don't like to fiddle with this kind of stuff either, so I like to be able to do it usually within 15 minutes or 20 minutes and start taking the images at that point. So I know this is a long video. Um, I'm hoping to be kind of elaborate on it and uh, elaborate in some of the areas that I think I missed before. I've got a lot of questions. I'm hoping I covered them with everybody um, as accurately as I can. Um, I, I may have misspoke too. I mean, sometimes I point at something and I say left and I mean right and I get things backwards. But I think people will kind of look at this and get a good... Um, you get my meaning of, of what I'm trying to accomplish here and how the tool kind of works. So hopefully it's beneficial. Um, if you want more information, you can always check out our website. Um, like I said, I do have uh, part one and part two, which kind of cover just our photon cages, and part two kind of covers how to build one and assemble it um, and get it set up on your scope. So this process is pretty generic. It can work for any tilter device, really. Um, just kind of a generalized video on how to actually adjust tilt, what I'm looking for, and um, I think I think it's a very... Uh, it's a very useful tool for everybody. So anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoy.